what is the evolutionary problem that's being solved, right? There's no account about any one problem. There are a lot of different reasons why people become depressed, and there are a lot of different predictors for why people become depressed. So one of the examples of uh, an evolutionary theory of depression has to do with uh, the explanation of sickness behavior uh, and how uh, being depressed can be a way of saving energy, like you, uh, you move around less, you do fewer things, you take, um, you take less risks. So if you think about when you have a cold or when you have the flu, it is a little bit like being depressed, right? Like you don't like things as much, you're kind of mopey, uh, you don't do a lot, uh, you may sleep a lot more than usual, you may not eat as much as you regularly do. Uh, and maybe the preference for foods changes a little bit. So that's kind of one, one account is that uh, we have depression as kind of this uh, sickness behavior that happens in situations when we need to like recharge our energy um, for whatever the reason. There are a lot of questions about are these, are these associations between medical illness and depression telling us something about the nature of depression, like it's an inflammatory disease or that it's a neurocognitive disease, uh, or is it just kind of a more natural consequence of being ill? If you think about the, the body from this kind of biopsychosocial perspective, you don't want to prioritize, oh, the depression is a real thing or the medical illness is the real thing, but they're both affecting the person. People become depressed after um, uh, social stressors like uh, your partner broke up with you, you failed to get a job that you really wanted, uh, somebody did something that was very humiliating to you. So this um, ruminating so much on that one event is supposed to help you solve that event and prioritize that event. Sometimes when people are ruminating and thinking on one thing repeatedly, that that's bad, but that sometimes it's actually helping them solve a problem that's very complex. And because of that, it requires a lot of thinking. Uh, and a lot of the other behaviors, for example, like withdrawing and not initiating new friendships or not pursuing new romantic partners, you can understand them in that context because if, you, if there's a problem that you need to solve, you, you're probably better off solving that problem before trying to take on new things. Uh, getting support from people. So if, I, um, if you see me crying, a natural thing for you to do may be to show support to me, right? So some, some people have argued that the symptoms of depression that are observable to others, like crying, like being down, making a sad face, there are like ways of calling out for help, but it's not, that the, it's not that the person is doing it on purpose to get help, but that it is a concrete way of, of evoking help from others and making sure they pay attention to you. Um, like, you know, one very clear example of this is when babies cry, right? So uh, crying would be a very adaptive behavior if it's always followed by being picked up. The question is like, what's the difference between sadness and depression? And what's the difference between happiness and mania? And there are very, very simple explanations to this. So I'll, and, and very, very complex ones. So the very, very simple one is that sadness is a natural emotion uh, and that people vary in how often they experience it. Uh, people vary in how intensely they experience it uh, and how long the feeling lasts when they do feel, get the feeling, right? So, from that perspective, it's very, very simple. Like you ask a person, how often have you been sad in the past two weeks? And if they've been sad for most of the time, they get kind of a check on that symptom of depression. If they were sad one time when they saw a sad movie, then you'd be more inclined to say, okay, that's a natural emotion. We can all agree on that we need to do that. But the question is, is it, a, is it valid to say that when you've been sad for two weeks for most of the time, that's a symptom of an illness or are there things that can happen to people that can make them sad for at least two weeks, uh, even intensely sad, but not have it be considered a disorder? Uh, a lot of us recognize that if somebody that is close to you and important to you dies, the, the kind of natural normal thing to do is to feel sad. To the point that it would almost kind of be weird not to grieve if somebody close to you died. 
Um, the question is like, is that too weak cut off? Like, is that really the period of time that we're allowed to grieve? A psychologist could interview you and determine, look, you have the symptom of sadness, you haven't been getting sleep, you have difficulty concentrating, uh, you're tired, and uh, you're not eating as well. Um, so I think that's enough to say that you have a major depressive episode. And I think that for a lot of people that doesn't, uh, that doesn't ring true that that's a disorder. And, and there's been some research to suggest that uh, people out in the community and also psychologists and other clinicians, um, they recognize that after something really bad happens to you, the symptoms of depression are kind of normal. The basic idea is that we don't really have a perfect way of determining when is something a disorder or not. And the duration and the intensity which the DSM uses, it's very easy for a lot of different people to say, oh yeah, it did last more than two weeks. Oh yeah, it was most of the time. It's just not clear whether that necessarily means it's a disorder. It's, it's interesting from a scientific perspective to just know like, when is it depression? When is it sadness? Um, is, there, is, there, is there even a distinction, right? Because it may just be that depression is just being very sad for a very long time and that there's just no good way of making a, a point at which it's pathology or not. But I think it matters for a lot of different reasons. So the most obvious one is uh, treatment. So if we know, for example, that a person has a state of sadness that maybe would go away on its own, then the question is, is there any benefit to treating that with psychotherapy, with antidepressants, or with their combination. Uh, and so when you think about the fact that in a lot of the studies that, we, that have been done in the States recently, 20% of the population will meet the criteria for depression at some point in their life. Um, that's up to 20% of people who could be getting treatment that we're not sure how much of it they need. Uh, but it's also recurrent, it's also heterogeneous in a lot of very, can you hear that? Okay, so let me move to the other room then. Uh, most people who have depression don't get the diagnosis by meeting identi the identical symptoms, right? So you only need five out of nine, but out of those five, um, most of them have in the criteria or, so for example, the first symptom is sadness or depressed mood. But you could say like, okay, well, sadness and depressed mood and hopelessness, they're kind of like conceptually, like they're, they're very similar things, right? You can also have it go in completely opposite directions, right? So with appetite, it's like you can either be overeating or you can be under eating. It can be either actually at the behavioral level or it can be you're eating the same, but you just have to force yourself to eat. So like your appetite is lower, but you're you're still doing the same. So you can see even how that introduces a level of heterogeneity. In most of my research, what I've found is that the severity of the symptoms matters, which makes a lot of sense, of course. Uh, the type of symptom usually doesn't matter. Um, sleep maybe matters a little bit. Psychomotor retardation, which is a little rare. Uh, that degree of involvement from like the motor system, that makes me think, well, that kind of does seem like it's something else. So I'm not saying the symptoms don't matter at all. They haven't mattered a lot, a lot to treatment yet, uh, but it's possible that they m mean something else, like um, what, vulner what genetic vulnerabilities a person has or what's their preferred way of coping. And maybe that says something about the, the, the treatment. It's a little bit complicated by the fact that when people have symptoms of depression repeatedly, they often don't meet the same symptoms that they met the first time around. So it's not like if you are a person that thought of suicide the one time that you're highly likely to think about suicide the next. So that we have these subtypes that are about symptoms, they don't seem to be very stable across time. And so that also kind of makes me wonder, well, how meaningful are the symptoms really?